Welcome to Relationship Reset with life coach, Dr. Mark Shook. In each podcast, Mark will weave together the ancient truths of scripture with the latest cutting edge neuroscience in short, concise, effective, and doable principles and actions to reset your relationship dynamic. Hello, I'm Mark Shook. I'm your host for Relationship Reset, where we're gonna dive into how to make your relationship just incredible. And we've been looking at emotionally focused therapy. Um, That model is based on seven transformative conversations that couples can have to break negative patterns, to address vulnerabilities, and to cultivate that, that deeper bond that we all long for. These conversations help partners recognize and express their emotions, leading to healing and to reconnection. So let's dive deeper into each of these conversations and their impact on relationships. Today, I want to look at the first conversation that Sue Johnson in her Emotionally Focused Therapy uh, talks about, and that's identifying destructive patterns. So this affects nearly every relationship at some point. For those of you who heard my sermon. I I touched on it a bit, but I want to go deeper on it. So for some of you, this will be a little bit of a review, but it's it took me like three or four times to really grasp it. So I know it's still going to be helpful. So what I'm talking about are negative patterns of communication that couples can get stuck in, often without realizing they keep having the same fight over and over. Dr. Sue Johnson calls these destructive patterns because they seem to take control of the relationship, pushing couples apart. There's no pulling together. But the good news is that by understanding these patterns, we can begin to recognize them. And more importantly, we can break free from them for the very first time. Some of us have been doing this for a lot of years, and it's time to break break free from that. So These are our negative communication patterns that couples can fall into when they feel emotionally disconnected or insecure in their relationship. And these dialogues are toxic, they're repetitive, and they 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 as they push the partners apart without either person fully understanding what's driving the conflict. They think it's the surface issues that they're fighting about, but it's something so much deeper. The book of Proverbs talks about how a man of understanding can draw out those deep waters of their partner's heart and understand and and get deeper and know exactly what's going on. That's what Sue Johnson is talking about here. Often they're related to our attachment needs, like the need to feel valued, the need to feel loved, the need to feel secure. And when those needs aren't met, we react defensively. And the way we react, can it can really drive like a wedge between us and our partner. So Johnson identifies three main destructive patterns. One, find the bad guy, she calls it. Two, the protest polka. And three, freeze and flee. So let's break these down further to understand how they play out, why they happen and how couples can recognize and shift out of these destructive cycles. The first one, find the bad guy. You could call it the blame game. Now, this is when two anxious attachments get together in a relationship, especially a romantic relationship. And the couple in this dialogue, they get locked into a pattern of mutual blame and accusation. Each partner feels hurt, feels attacked, and in response, they attack back, trying to prove that the other person is at fault. This dialogue creates an escalating conflict, a cycle of conflict where both partners focus on assigning blame instead of addressing the deeper emotional pain underneath. Just imagine a couple. Let's just call them John and Sarah. John comes home late from work, and Sarah's upset that he didn't call to let her know. Sarah might start with, you always do this. You never care about my feelings. Always and never are big clues that you're in the blame game. 
that you're in the find the bad guy mode. John might be feeling attacked at that point, probably would be, and he responds with, I've been working so hard to provide for this family. You're the one who never, there it is again, appreciates what I do. Well, why does this happen? The find the bad, the find the bad guy dialogue happens when both partners are feeling vulnerable, or they're feeling hurt, or they're feeling scared. But instead of expressing those underlying emotions because they are vulnerable, instead of expressing them directly, they defend themselves by going on attack. See, it's easier to point out what's wrong with the other person than to admit, I feel scared. I feel, I feel like you, you don't care about me. So it's important to get to the underlying emotions behind the accusations. There's often fear, sadness, feelings of inadequacy. For example, Sarah might feel neglected or unimportant to John, while John might feel unappreciated and maybe even inadequate as a partner. I can never please her. I'm never going to be enough. That happens on both sides. Both are struggling to express these vulnerable feelings, and instead, they lash out. So what's the solution? To break free of this cycle, couples need to shift from attacking to being vulnerable. But first, you have to recognize the cycle, right? Are you in the blame game? Are you guys both trying to find the bad guy? Are you both trying to win the fight? Because, see, you can win this fight and still both of you lose. Instead of saying, you never think about me, what could Sarah say? She could say, you know, when you didn't call, I, I felt really anxious and unimportant. And, and that kind of shift opens the door for John to respond with compassion rather than defensiveness. And then if he'll get vulnerable and let her know how he's feeling, it just moves back and forth and back and forth, and it's a whole different game. See, when you really see your partner's heart instead of these defended emotions, everything softens. It's interesting because the book of Proverbs says a harsh, a harsh answer just stirs up wrath, but a soft answer turns away wrath. It's amazing. Even if one starts that blame game, the other one giving a soft answer back, somebody's got to be the one that's the adult don't stay in the child mode, the childish things. The second, she calls the protest polka because it's kind of like a dance. This is the pursue withdraw cycle. And it's the most common destructive pattern. The reason why it's the most common, it's because usually an anxious attachment gets together with an avoidant attachment. I don't know why, but we attract like magnets. Laura and I are like that. I'm an anxious attachment. She's an avoidant attachment. And so that occurs when, when one partner, usually feeling disconnected or emotionally abandoned, protests by demanding more attention, affection, reassurance. The other partner, feeling overwhelmed by these demands, usually they're negative, or unsure of how to respond, withdraws or just shuts down emotionally. And this withdrawal makes the first person even more anxious, leading them to protest louder, which then causes more withdrawal. You see the cycle? Protest, withdraw, protest, withdraw. It's a never-ending cycle. Let me just give you an example. Anna constantly seeks reassurance from her partner, Mike, asking him why he doesn't spend more time with her or why he doesn't seem to care as much as he used to. And Mike, feeling criticized and overwhelmed, starts to withdraw into a shell, spending more time in his own world, avoiding the conflict, maybe spending more time at work or in his hobbies or just watching TV or just not available emotionally. This withdrawal makes Anna feel more abandoned, so she pushes harder, perhaps by nagging or accusing him of not loving her anymore. And that cycle, it just keeps going with Anna pursuing and Mike pulling further away. Why does this happen? It often arises when one partner feels emotionally deprived and fears they're losing the connection 
with their partner. That's the anxious. That's always going to be the anxious partner doing that. The protesting partner is the anxious partner like Anna. She's not necessarily angry at heart. She's afraid, afraid of losing the emotional bond or of never having had it and never going to have it. On the other hand, the withdrawing partner like Mike may feel cornered, flooded. You know, if, if, if the withdrawing partner is a male, guys, we can flood. Ladies, you don't even understand how much we flood with adrenaline and cortisol. You do it some, but we can get overwhelmed and unsure of ourselves and how to meet the other's emotional needs. We, we can withdraw to protect ourselves from what is perceived as like a constant criticism, a constant nagging. But what's the underlying emotion, again, for the protesting partner? The dominant emotion isn't anger. It's fear or anxiety about being abandoned. They may feel like they're not important enough to be loved. For the withdrawing partner, the primary emotion is often a fear, but a fear of failure or inadequacy, leading to feelings of overwhelm, thus to avoidance. So what's the solution to, to stop that protest polka, the protest withdrawal, destructive pattern? Both partners need to recognize their roles in the cycle. Again, we have to recognize it. The pursuing partner, like Anna, needs to express their need for connection in a softer, less critical way. What if Anna said something like, Mike, I just miss feeling close to you. And... I'm getting really scared that maybe we're growing apart. The withdrawing, the withdrawing partner, Mike, needs to stay engaged and acknowledge their partner's emotional pain, saying something like, I hear that you're feeling lonely. I really want to work on being more present with you. What a difference that is. Getting a little bit deeper, going under the armored emotions of anger. The last of those destructive patterns is called freeze and flee. That can happen when two avoidance get together. Very unusual for two avoidance to get together in a relationship, but they do every once in a while. And you could also call this destructive pattern the emotional shutdown. In the freeze and flee dialogue, both partners disengage from the relationship emotionally. Instead of one partner protesting and the other withdrawing, both partners shut down. And they may avoid talking about their emotions altogether, stop trying to connect, or live in a state of a, just emotional numbness. In this dialogue, it's not uncommon for couples to look fine on the outside, but to be completely disconnected on the inside. You also see this pattern when if you're in the one where the anxious is kind of attacking and the avoidant is withdrawing, that the anxious one finally gets tired of trying to connect and gives up. And for the avoidant, things get really peaceful for a while, but then suddenly they realize we're not connected at all. And the sad thing about this, this last destructive pattern, it can be the one that's right before the end. That's the one, if I see that in my office, oh, we're in a tough spot. It's going to be difficult to get this turned around. I've seen God do it, but it's not often because both have withdrawn. Neither is emotionally connected. So as a couple, let me give you an example. Sam and Emily may look like they're functioning well. They don't fight as much as they used to, but they also don't really talk about anything important. Sam spends his evenings watching TV and Emily buries herself in work or social media. They share the same space. They live in the same house, but they also live emotionally separate lives, avoiding any potential conflict or deep emotional engagement. You know, the generation before the boomers, the you know, they called it the silent generation, a lot of you may be, if you're a boomer, you, your parents were in that because 
you see that happen so often in that generation where it's just like we're here, we're together, but we're not really together. There's really no emotional connection, but yeah, mom and dad are in the house, but they're not emotionally available to each other or to the kids. This whole freeze and, and, and flee kind of feel happens when both partners just have become emotionally exhausted, defeated, hopeless. They don't continue engaging. Maybe after repeated cycles of blame and protest and withdrawal, both people feel like it's, it's safer just to disconnect than to risk more emotional pain. They've tried to reach out in the past but felt rejected, misunderstood. And so it's led to that emotional shutdown. So what's the underlying emotion? Underneath that withdrawal, withdrawal, that freeze and flee pattern, there's usually a lot of pain, a lot of hopelessness, a lot of hurt. Both partners probably feel emotionally abandoned and may believe that their relationship can't be repaired. While on the surface, they seem disengaged. Both partners may actually be longing for emotional connection, but are too afraid or tired to pursue it. Well, what's the solution? To break out of this freeze, one or both of the partners is going to have to take a risk. It's going to have to be vulnerable and begin to express their deep feelings of loneliness and fear. Now, this is going to feel incredibly vulnerable because it requires admitting how much they still care about the relationship despite all those years of feeling disconnected. But couples can begin to rebuild by creating these small moments of emotional connection, gradually increasing their emotional vulnerability with each other. And that's how you break free. So again, Sue Johnson, she emphasized that to break free from these destructive patterns, couples need to shift from a defensive, blaming stance to one of vulnerability and openness. Again, the key strategies include, one, identifying the pattern. First, you need to recognize that cycle that you're stuck in and, and name the pattern. You can go, oh, here we go again with the blame game or find the bad guy or we're doing the protest polka they can start to separate the problem from each other because it's not your partner that's a problem, it's the cycle that's the problem. And then secondly, you share vulnerable emotions. Instead of focusing, focusing on those surface level armored emotions like anger or frustration, couples dig deeper into what's really going on emotionally. Are they feeling abandoned, unimportant, unloved? Share these deeper feelings, that's the antidote for that destructive pattern. And then number three, create new patterns of interaction. Once you've shared your deeper emotions, you can begin to create new positive cycles of interaction. This often involves offering reassurance, expressing empathy, creating moments of bonding that reinforce the emotional safety in the relationship. So breaking those destructive patterns, that's the first conversation. They're so powerful because they tap into our deepest fears about love, connection, and security. But this holds, this conversation holds a roadmap for couples to, to break free from the patterns and teaches us to communicate from a place of vulnerability and emotional openness. And the key is that recognizing behind every fight, there's a hidden plea for connection. And once that plea is heard, the negative cycles, it's almost like magic, but it's like a miracle. It's like what God does. They just begin to dissolve. So remember, the key to transforming your relationship isn't about avoiding conflict. It's about learning how to connect emotionally, even when things are hard. So that's the first conversation. Discover those destructive patterns and we're going to delve really deeply into the next conversation in our next podcast. We call it Finding the Raw Spots. And this is going to be an eye opener to almost every one of us. And we've just never really been taught this. I know it changed our marriage. 
in a profound way when we, we begin to discover our raw spots and our triggers. So I'll see you next time on Relationship Reset.